I hate to say let's go into the future because the yeah. present is pretty darn good. Yeah. Right. The present but is let, good. Let's take a look at, at some of the, the new maintenance strategies, induction strategies. Who wants to start us off talking about the most recent switch maintenance trials? Who wants to do that? I can, I can please talk about some of these studies. So the, the strategy for switch is this. If your viral load is undetectable and you have no resistance, you can switch to almost any other even modestly effective combination and the switch will work. So, for example, um, there's a combination, Paul mentioned Rilpivirine, Rilpivirine, FTC, and TAF, and there have been a couple of new studies with that particular combination. Rilpivirine is not a drug that we would use in somebody whose baseline viral load was greater than 100,000 copies or whose CD4 counts were less than 200. But if you look at people whose viral loads are undetectable on tenofovir FTC efavirans or on the older formulation of tenofovir FTC rilpivirine and you switch them to TAF FTC rilpivirine, they maintain virologic suppression just as effectively as if you continued them on their previous therapy. So I think that that kind of study is just representative of all of the switch studies. If you're virologically suppressed and there's no history of resistance, you can switch almost ad lib to any other effective combination. And, and I, I think the controversy really is is when you're, I, I totally agree with what, what, what Ian says. There's some, you know, the, where you see risk in a switch is where someone is on a kind of a high barrier drug like a boosted protease inhibitor and you, and, you, and, you, and you don't know their kind of resistance history, and, and then you switch them to a, a lower barrier, uh, like an NNRTI, for example, or even some of the integrase, like l or Raltegravir. There, there's some risk there, but there are no studies like that, because the companies don't want to do that kind of risky stuff in studies. What, what's happening, I think, is there, there's also kind of a, a, like a, this kind of de-intensification, like can we go down to two drugs? Okay. Uh, and then there are even some studies uh, uh, going down to one drug, um, and and I think those are kind of on the edge in, in some some respects. And Paul, yeah, I mean, my, my thoughts on the two drug, especially when one of the two drugs is a protease inhibitor and the other one's lamivudine, oh, sure. is that there are now enough randomized data that you could take someone from boosted protease inhibitor plus two nucleosides sure, and switch them to boosted protease inhibitor plus lamivudine or, or emtricitabine, and they will maintain suppression yeah. just fine. Right. That's, that's, that was done in you know, the Darunavir study that was just presented in Glasgow, <laughs> and it was been done in the, right. the, uh, the Adizanavir study. Just so that we recognize what these studies yeah. are. There's the switch from TDF to TAF containing ART yeah, study. Yeah, no-brainer, right? Yeah, that's no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah. No Those brainer. are all no fine. The dual Jacita 8014 yep. study? Works fine. Right. Yeah. That's okay. what Paul was talking about. That's what you were talking about. So basically simplifying from boosted PI and two nukes to boosted PI in our best tolerated nuke, which is 3TC or FTC. Yeah. And, and while there's the, the most recent one was with darunavir, there's ones with lopinavir, there's ones with adazanavir, there's a, really they all, a ton it, of data. They all work. They, they, it works. And then there's the, if I'm pronouncing this right, domono study or domono study? Yeah. What is that? I'm not so keen on that one. Yeah. Tell me about it. Well, it's just using dolutegravir, which I've alluded to, which I think is our best integrase inhibitor, as the sole treatment for people who are virologically suppressed. And it's not as if uh, that is necessarily giving them any benefit except for only maybe saving money. I mean, it really, it, I don't, I don't see that. There's just no compelling reason yeah, to do it. I just and don't see the reason to do it. And it's, it's also that some, some of the studies, there's been a little bit of virologic rebound and, and right, there's, problems. There's well, in, really, that, in that yeah. study, you know, I think, you know, it gets reported as non-inferior, but I think if you look at that oh, no, data it's inferior. carefully, it's inferior. You know, it they, looks they, they inferior. They have a crazy endpoint, which you know, is a viral load of 200 exactly. for people who have been suppressed forever. It's not, that's not the right Less than point. 50. And if right, you look right. at the less than 50 data, people are not being right. maintained at the same rate of suppression if they're on diutegravir monotherapy. We did this with protease inhibitors. We tried the monotherapy approach, and it didn't really work. And I don't, I don't think it's going to work. Really it just didn't work quite as well. Right. right. The, the same thing is probably going to be true with this. So you'd right. have to have a really good reason mm -hmm. right. to do it. Right. But do and you realize what you're all saying? I mean, you're talking about it's really good or really, really good. Right. If we got one of these 20 years ago, 
You'd sure, of course, it'd be a different Absolutely. story. Sure. Right. 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 Sure. But, but, but you, you, know, you, you can't mess up with HIV because HIV will become resistant. Right, and, 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 and it you will don't limit have your an options. infinite number of choices. Yeah. You have lots of choices, so, and you can rescue most people. But, but, but if you kind of start blowing your integrase inhibitor, you know, you just, you, you're going down a slippery slope that right. you don't need so to go down. So why, just why no do reason. that? These studies, these abbreviated regimens, the studies are basically coming out of Europe. And the reason is cost is a much greater consideration for the choice of regimens in Europe than in the United States. And in our country, fortunately, we still have a healthcare system that is willing to pay for these medications. I think it is a huge mistake to try to shave the number of drugs down to the fewest number, the smallest number that is going to be effective. You know, you have to have a better reason than just saving money. Yes, if there's a potential risk, and there are risks. You know, a lot of people have done these avant-garde type switches, and they've blown up in their face. So I think we have to be careful. When we originally did the boosted PI lamivudine studies, it was because there was a compelling reason to try to avoid tenofovir and abacavir in a subset of people. We don't have that as compelling a reason now as we used to. All right. And, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, when you, when you say they're expensive, the therapies that we're using, yeah. it's really expensive to get a population of people with rebound and lots of virus and then everything yeah. explodes. Right. It's not just the cost of the drugs here that we're talking about. Yeah. Right? I mean, H HIV therapy, does stand the test of cost effectiveness because the, the benefits, the health benefits are so huge. So even at their relatively high cost. You, you were talking about cost per year of yeah, life. And yeah. that, that's really where the, the answer is. And for society too, right? Even an expensive therapy, if you prevent the spread of this oh. virus, then it, there's all, I don't want to use the word herd immunity because it's not right. But you do keep the virus contained. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And that's different, and that's yeah. important. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, been, it's been projected that if you have enough people virologically suppressed, the epidemic will eventually end. You know, that, that could happen.